This month on Connections. Hola from Pilsen, where visitors will be surrounded by the warmth of Mexico at the Mexican Fine Arts Center Museum, our first stop. Next, our journey around Chicagoland takes us toward the Loop, on board one of the CTA's seven rail lines, and a look at how careful orchestration keeps trains moving. Then, a story for every train lover as we take a trip back in time for a look at the evolution of the CTA rail car. Our trip continues on the Blue Lines O'Hare branch, heading toward a neighborhood where old world traditions mesh with the hip and trendy. Our destination, Ukrainian Village. Next, we head west and introduce you to two CTA employees working hard every day to ensure a smooth commute for you. As we continue westbound on the number 72 North Avenue bus, we'll tell you why teaming two popular CTA initiatives is going to save you money. A quick transfer to the number 82 Kimball Home and Bus, and we'll head a little further south, ending our trip at the Peace Museum, our last stop. So hop on board and for the next half hour, sit back and enjoy a trip around Chicagoland on the CTA. Hi, I'm Dale Rivera. Welcome to Connections, where you can learn all about using public transportation around Chicagoland. If you've ever wanted to travel to Mexico, you're about to see that the CTA can take you there. Just get off at the 18th Street Station on the Blue Line's 54th Cermak branch, and you're steps away from experiencing Mexico's rich history, culture, and heritage at the Mexican Fine Arts Center Museum, our first stop. Chicago's Pilsen Little Village neighborhood is the largest Mexican community in the Midwest. And in the heart of it sits the Mexican Fine Arts Center Museum, the only facility of its kind in the country. The important role that the museum plays here in Chicago or even in the United States is one of education. We educate not only the Mexican community and remind them of their culture and their history, but also we try to teach non-Mexicans uh, the depth of the Mexican culture and the history. The Mexican Fine Arts Center Museum opened its doors in 1987, and ever since it's been serving as a beacon of Mexican heritage. There are so many Mexicanos who now live in Chicago and throughout the U.S. And uh, what a better way to really come to know your neighbors and to understand them than through their art, through their culture, and through their traditions. One of the museum's most prominent exhibits is Mexicanidad, Our Past is Present. And it incorporates ceramics, wood carvings, fine art, photography, and video installations. What this exhibit does is it tries to trace the cultural history of Mexico. It starts with the ancient pre-Columbian past, goes through the colonial, into the contemporary, and the final section is the Mexican experience in the United States, something that we've kind of added onto Mexican history. This mural, created by a group of indigenous people from northern Mexico, is made up of millions of little glass beads that are embedded into wax panels. It's a real spectacular piece. As people approach it, uh, oftentimes are drawn in, and then when they realize that it's made of these millions of little tiny beads, I think that's where the awe and the wonder really sort of hits them. The museum's mantra? Mexican culture is culture sin fronteras, which means without borders. We take a lot of pride at this museum in that the exhibits that we display and the pieces that we have on display, they're very well crafted, they're very creative, very imaginative, and I think they're really accessible to everybody. And the museum itself is just as accessible to patrons as the art inside, because admission is free. Being the last free museum in the city really helps us in Pilsen especially. Um, a lot of people uh, who would maybe not have access to the museum do because of the fact that we're free. The Mexican Fine Arts Center Museum houses thousands of art objects that feature the finest Mexican craftsmanship and creativity from both sides of the border. And of course, the CTA can take you there. Here's how. 
So travel to Mexico without ever leaving Chicago on board the CTA. On an average workday, more than 1,100 rail cars operate on seven rail lines, providing approximately a half a million rides. That's a lot of rail travel, and it's all intricately timed and carefully planned out to make sure that your commute stays on track. While on board the L, thousands of CTA customers pass through train junctions each day. Junctions, or interlockings, are where train lines come together, or cross, like here at Clark Junction, where the red, brown, and purple lines merge. When trains travel through the CTA's busiest, most complex junctions, they're under the watchful eye of tower operators, who monitor the trains electronically to make sure they pass through the junction safely, quickly, and smoothly. And all of this is accomplished through something that we technically call track circuit occupancy. It's an electronic detection of a train on a track. And the towerman's responsibility is to route the trains through the interlocking with schedule in mind and customer service so that there's no delays and everything is done so safely. One of the busiest junctions on the CTA system is at Howard Station, where the red, yellow, and purple lines come together. Here, the tower operators continually track arriving and departing trains, similar to the way air traffic controllers monitor planes. We kind of do the same thing. We decide what track the trains are going to come in, what track, what track they're going to leave out on, what time they're going to leave, and if there's any problem, they also communicate with us. As CTA trains pass through junctions, customers may not even know it. The goal of the tower operators is to keep travel seamless, although at times two trains may show up at a junction simultaneously. Sometimes when you approach an interlocking, the move is transparent, and other times you have to wait a few seconds, and that's just a function of the variabilities of traffic. During rush hour at the Wells and Lake Street Junction in the Loop, tower operators are carefully choreographing train movements inside of Tower 18. This was once the busiest train junction in North America. We have four different train lines pass through there, and at the height of the rush hour, we have almost 60 trains pass through, so that's almost a train a minute. The CTA has come a long way since junctions were manually switched in the late 1800s. And today, even better electronic technologies are planned for Clark Junction, where a new signal system is being installed from Armitage to Addison. If you look at Clark Junction and understand that the red line, the brown line, and the purple line all pass through there, and you add up the sum total of customers served by the red, brown, and purple lines, that's over 50% of our traffic base. Throughout the CTA system, there are more than 50 different junctions and towers. Some are very small and some much larger. But whatever the interlocking, the CTA is always working to make sure your trip on the L is as smooth and safe as possible. started the process of putting new rail cars on its system. It recently issued a request for manufacturers to bid on the production of new train cars. Improving its infrastructure is an important part of the CTA's ability to keep its current customers and to attract new ones. The evolution of its rail cars is just one example of how the CTA keeps its customers on the move. The speed and efficiency of modern CTA trains is something most of us take for granted each day. But over time, CTA trains have evolved. The CTA has preserved a number of historic trains and others can be found at local railway museums. So let's take a step back in time. Back in the 1800s, Chicago's first forms of public transportation were horse-drawn omnibuses and cable cars. 
the first omnibus line opening on State Street in 1859, consisting of small wooden carriages um, hauled on rails by horses, superseded in the 1880s by cable cars. The cable cars were able to haul many more people much more efficiently, but also had very ex uh, expensive infrastructure that had to be installed. Public transportation in Chicago made a big leap in the late 1800s with the steam locomotive, which pulled wooden train cars like this one. The CTA's car number one was the first car built for the South Side Elevated Line. It is of great historical significance. It was used for about 40 years before it was retired from passenger service, but was retained by the CTA as one of its historic pieces and was restored to near original condition in the 1960s. Inside, you can still see car number one's original woodwork, as well as its ornate details. But what lies beneath the car is of even greater significance. Motors were installed in each rail car of this series, replacing the need for steam locomotives. With the addition of the multiple unit control, or MU, each rail car now had its own power source and control. The South Side was not only the first uh, to use MU in Chicago, but actually in the world, and is now considered standard equipment on all rapid transit vehicles. In the early 1900s, another new train car was introduced in Chicago, this time on the Metropolitan West Side Elevated Line. This car, which ran on the Met, was an indication of things to come. It was the first chance where people could come in through an air-operated door and enter into a fully enclosed car throughout its 48-foot length. In the 1920s, another new train car arrived in Chicago, the 4000 series. Designers were thinking of the future when they built these cars. They were made of steel as they were going to be used in Chicago's future subways. It was impressive in the State Street subway to see all the newest cars running making up these six and seven car trains running back and forth across the city. The 4000 series cars were modified over the years and they carried CTA passengers all the way until the 1970s. These decades also brought another change for train cars. Beginning in the 30s and going well through the uh, post-war years, extensive ornamentation was considered to be old-fashioned. Uh, stainless steel, sleek lines, those were the things that were considered modern amenities and they were incorporated into the CTA's transit vehicles. But it wasn't until the CTA's 6000 series cars were built in the 1950s that modern amenities really made an impact. The heat was there, the four-star ventilation, modern bullseye lighting so you could actually read the fine print of the financial section of the paper when you're riding to work. Big difference. The 6000 series cars were well built and easy to maintain, and they ran on CTA tracks up until 1992. Another train car soon came up on the heels of the 6000 series. The 2000 series was built in 1964, and for the first time, customers experienced air conditioning inside a train car. Pullman Company was quite proud of the fact that the cars were air conditioned, they had a modern front end to them, and uh, they certainly made a big advancement uh, in transportation in Chicago. Today, you'll find four different models of rail cars running on the CTA system, and the CTA is in the midst of selecting a manufacturer for new rail cars. The new cars will take about three years to build and will replace the older cars used on the system today. Criteria for the new rail cars include security cameras, aisle facing seating, and alternating current or an AC power system, different than the direct current or DC power system now used by the CTA. DC power is becoming obsolete and converting to the modern AC system will improve reliability and reduce the cost of maintaining an outdated system. AC propulsion systems are used by other large transit agencies such as New York, Washington DC, and Atlanta. The new cars may also include aisle-facing seating, something that the CTA experimented with in 2004 and that is already in use on other large transit systems throughout the world. Aisle-facing seating will allow the CTA to accommodate more customers per rail car and provide a more comfortable trip a priority for the second largest transit system in the country.
The cars get more sophisticated and they do get more comfortable in certain ways for customers. You also have a smoother ride and a more reliable vehicle. Along the Blue Lines O'Hare branch, you can experience a touch of Europe. Just get off at the Damon stop, take a short bus ride, and you'll be in a neighborhood where you're likely to find pierogies and dumplings at every turn, not to mention a friendly face. Our destination? Chicago's Ukrainian Village. Nestled between Wicker Park, Humboldt Park, and the near west side is a Chicago neighborhood made up of 32 square blocks of pure charm. That's both modern and vintage charm. From its housing to its churches, restaurants, and shops, the Ukrainian village, with its European influence, has evolved into one of the city's most vibrant and ethnically diverse communities. It's gotten a lot more beautiful. It's a lot more exciting. There are little niches, nooks. I just think it's wonderful. Dr. George Risilek has been actively involved in the neighborhood for many years and has offered to show us around. Tell me why Ukrainian Village is such a great destination. Ukrainian Village is a really nice area located not 10, 15 minutes from downtown Chicago. And uh, people find this uh, an exciting area to live in and be close to work at the same time. Ukrainian Village is over 100 years in the making. Ukrainian immigrants were among the first to settle here. The area has not always been populated uh, primarily by Ukrainians, but it's been populated by uh, waves of immigrants uh, going back to uh, uh, Polish and uh, Jewish and some German uh, immigrants in the early part of the uh, 20th century. Ukrainians uh, came here uh, actually in the beginning of uh, the 1900s and have uh, steadily grown. Uh, in proportion of the people that live here. And those Ukrainian immigrants brought many of their homeland traditions which remain evident today. There are bakeries and restaurants, like the popular Saks, serving Ukrainian fare like Vereneke or Ukrainian pierogies. And for evidence of more Ukrainian influence, be sure to look up. The gilded domes of several churches dot the sky, and be sure to check out the Holy Trinity Russian Orthodox Cathedral. It was built in 1903 and designed by one of America's most influential architects, Louis Sullivan. It became a Chicago landmark in 1979. Ukrainian history and heritage is preserved and on display at the Ukrainian National Museum of Chicago. This is a must-see. The Ukraine National Museum was started in 1952 with the intention that while in Ukraine the Soviets were burning all the churches, all the museums, all the cultural homes, so then when Ukraine would be free of Soviet occupation, all of these items would go back to Ukraine. In 1991, Ukraine became a free nation. The museum houses an extensive collection of photographs and memorabilia including one section devoted to the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. And be sure to check out the museum's prized collection of pasanke, or Ukrainian Easter eggs, known for their artistic beauty. Feast your eyes on more beauty at the Ukrainian Institute of Modern Art. The museum is home to an impressive permanent collection of works by Chicago artists, as well as sculpture and paintings by artists of Ukrainian descent. So whether you come to shop, dine, explore, worship, or stroll, you're bound to be inspired, enlightened, and fulfilled in your visit to Chicago's Ukrainian Village. And remember, the CTA can get you there. Here's how. It's a nice area, you can get some good food. Uh, you might be able to see some very interesting architecture in, in Chicago and learn about uh, Chicago as the city of neighborhoods and by visiting one of its neighborhoods, the Ukrainian village.
It's critical to CTA operations that turnstiles, bus fare boxes, and automated fare card machines remain in good repair. So when a tune-up is in order, there are two CTA employees who can do it better than anyone. They're the 2004 CTA rodeo champs who make things more convenient for customers whenever they step on board. Hopping on board the CTA each day, you might not think about fare boxes, automated vending machines, and turnstiles, but the CTA certainly does. Our customers' first impression of the CTA is going to be paying that fare. So if they have a positive experience, we're hoping that that positive attitude carries on to the rest of their trip. Quick, easy, and convenient fare operations are so important at the CTA that there are even specialists to fix the fare boxes, automated fare card machines, and turnstiles when they're in need of repair. Two of the top guys for the job are Bill Moore and George Isa, and both are 2004 CTA rodeo champions. This is the second year in a row that Bill has taken home first prize in the rodeo's bus fare box category. I was happy because that was the second time and uh, I got a lot of guys who keep telling me that they're going to beat me and they're putting the pressure on it. <laughs> Bill's 15 years experience on the job and his extensive knowledge of fare boxes certainly paid off. I like working with my hands, mechanical and I like electronics, and it's a combination of both, so it works out good. <laughs> During the rodeo competition, CTA technicians tried to beat each other and the clock when repairing fare equipment. For George, it was an important year. After coming in second place two years in a row, this time it was his turn to shine. For me, it was easy because I'm being in the field a lot, so it was easy, simple problems. I found them right away and I win the champion this time. George has been with the CTA for just over four years, and the secret to his success is that he loves his job. Yeah, I love this job, you know, because there's a lot of technical in it, and I like to do that. When it comes to maintaining fare equipment, sometimes it can take just a few minutes, or it may take hours. But whatever needs to be done now or in the future, both Bill and George are up to the task. Their expertise in this environment is very important. As this technology changes over the years, they've got the qualities to can kind of go with the flow, enjoy the new technology. So next time you're paying your fare for a ride on the CTA, remember Bill and George are behind the scenes making sure your trip is a smooth one. Think about how hard it is to make a dollar and how easy it is to spend it. Well, these days, customers who use the CTA to get to work can actually hold on to more of their earnings with the CTA's Transit Benefit Program. All it takes is a little basic training. At Chicago's Loyola University, Benefits Director Dale Moyer encourages employees to sign up for the CTA's Transit Benefit Program especially now that the Chicago Card Plus is part of the plan. It's really convenient for the employees. Uh, no longer did they have to receive the Chicago Transit Card distributed to their place of work. Instead, they could simply do the pre-tax contributions to a card and they own that card from that point forward. With one permanent fare card, Transit Benefit customers can monitor their accounts online. They can also receive email notification if they've depleted the amount on their card. And, most importantly, if a card is lost, you just report it to the CTA and your balance is protected. Of course, the Chicago Card Plus makes traveling on the CTA even more convenient and economical. Because it's a smart card, people can board buses and pass through rail station turnstiles much more quickly because you simply touch the card to the touchpad versus having to insert a fare card into the fare box. We also provide a $1 bonus for every $10 added to an account. The CTA has conducted informational sessions for human resource managers on the advantages of the Transit Benefit Program and Chicago Card Plus. For example, when companies sign up for the Transit Benefit Program, employees pay for their CTA fare card with pre-tax dollars. Depending on the value they choose to put on their card each month, customers can save up to 40% on commuting costs. 
That translates to extra money in their paychecks because the deduction is pre-tax. And for employers, that pre-tax deduction results in savings on payroll taxes. And when employees use the Chicago Card Plus, employers avoid administrative fees, not to mention distribution headaches. With Chicago Card Plus, each employer has its own online account. They simply log on between the 5th and 15th of each month to place the order. So it's much simpler. And the fact that CTA mails these cards to the employee's home, it cuts out the distribution process that they would otherwise have with the transit cards. For more information on the Transit Benefit Program with Chicago Card Plus, call the Transit Benefit Hotline at 312-681-3093 or log on to www.transitchicago.com. Teaming the Transit Benefit Program with Chicago Card Plus made a lot of sense to Dale Moyer, and he says the enrollment in the program at Loyola University is always increasing. Its benefits and popularity continue to grow as we see more and more people uh, enrolling in it every month. As a program participant, Dale's own commute is easier than ever. I find it's a tremendously uh, helpful and an easy to use benefit by simply just swiping it past the reader and entering on the subway that way. The number 82 Kimball Home and Bus is taking us south on our way to a museum dedicated to promoting one of the world's most noble quests. The Peace Museum is our last stop. Beneath the Gold Dome in Garfield Park sits a unique museum that celebrates peace. The Peace Museum was founded in 1981 by Chicago muralist Mark Rogiven and by Marjorie Craig Benton, an ambassador to UNICEF. Chicago's Peace Museum is the largest and most well-known of its kind in the nation. We're looking to actually promote a culture of peace, and I think that's our similarity with other museums, is that they're often looking to preserve culture, but in our case, we're actually looking to preserve a culture of peace through the arts. The Peace Museum is located just off the Green Lines Conservatory Station, so let the CTA take you there. We'll take you on a tour of the museum next month. But before we go, we just told you all about the CTA. Now, the CTA wants to know about you. The CTA knows one thing about you already. You watch Connections. But we want to know more, like how often you use the CTA, and when you do, where you go. Just head to your computer and log on to transitchicago.com and click on the Take the CTA Connection Survey. You can also share a story idea and tell us about the stories you find most interesting. Sharing your thoughts and comments is as easy as point and click. We hope you'll take a minute to take the survey. Then join us here again next month for the start of another journey around Chicagoland on the CTA. I'm Dale Rivera. Thanks for watching Connections. For more information about the CTA or to use the RTA's trip planner, visit our website at www.transitchicago.com or for customer service matters, call 1-888-YOUR-CTA. For travel information, call the RTA at 836-7000 from anywhere in the Chicago area.